All right, Chris, so you were on the team with Bryson when he made the drastic increase in club head speed. Talk about that process and how you went about maneuvering that. I mean, Bryson was already like a great player, good ball striker, and just looking at the stats as a team, we're like, you know, if you got some more speed and you didn't lose like, you know, significant control over the ball, this could be a great place, an opportunity to just get better, to, to you know, shoot better scores, whatever, just from the strokes getting off the tee, right? So in my mind, the biggest thing was like, don't do anything to mess up your release pattern, the way your wrist, the hands, the club's working through, say, like, late in the downswing. Um, in my mind, that's, like, one of the, the biggest predictors of a person's ball flight control. So it's like, how do we create speed without touching that? Like, that's the constraint, right? So then it was stuff like, how do you make a bigger turn? How do you use the ground a little bit differently? Doing a lot of, like, what I would call a neurological type training, just trying to go faster, you know, almost like a sprinter running downhill, just how do you get yourself to just move faster. Did a lot of stuff in the gym, uh, worked with Greg uh, Roscoff with MAT sort of training practices. So it's definitely this like from every single angle, which in some ways makes it hard to know what exactly had what effect because it's not this perfect experiment. It was a little bit of a shotgun approach, but from just some guys don't care about it to be like a controlled experiment. They just want to get better, right? So if they think something's going to help, they're going to try it all at the same time. So what we did pretty quickly, he was able to get like big jump in club head speed and uh, was able to still drive it pretty darn straight like he had a window there where he was probably one of the better drivers that we've seen in a long long time so that was you know more or less the approach we had was there ever a point in the process where you were getting a little uneasy or thought that hey maybe we're going too far with this i would say in that early stages we also measured him on uh, gears quite a bit and force plates so there's a little bit of like tracking how was this changing over time and the analogy i gave was like okay we're leaving breadcrumbs in the forest in case it does get out of sorts we can kind of back out of it a bit and maybe you know hopefully not get too uh, far down a path that didn't work for him luckily that didn't really happen especially in that first whatever it was time frame won a few times when the US Open at Wingfoot. And then I think at some point it became trying to get that extra club at speed. And then it kind of got into, you know, maybe doing the things like creating some more lag and transition, whatever. Um, and that's where, you know, to me it's like tap the brakes. That's probably not like the best way to do it if you're also trying to optimize for club face control. I mean, for the most part, he got a bunch more club at speed and he's, you know, played some pretty good golf. So. Yeah. so obviously you work with a bunch of tour pros and I'm sure uh, the topic of speed comes up from time to time. What's your process look like when it comes to evaluating, hey, yes, this player is ready for speed or no, we might need to hold off and chase this at a later time. I mean, I think everybody can gain some more speed. You get to a certain place where you're like maybe, you know, over 190 mile an hour where it starts to plateau what you get out of an extra, say, you know, whatever ball speed, right? So I do think the it becomes like diminishing returns in a sense. So but you think that mark is at 190? I don't know exactly where it is, but it's probably somewere, I'm gonna guess like 195-ish, something okay. like that, where with the same angular displacement projected outward, you start to get, you know, that distribution starts to get to where maybe you're hitting in too many fairway bunkers or out of bounds or penalty shots or whatever, so where it doesn't, you don't quite get as much out of an extra ball speed. So I do think there is that, that place, but for most people on tour, if they can hit it farther and they don't hit it any less straight, angrily, they are gonna get an increase in their strokes getting off the tee. But it's like an ecosystem, right? So if a person's used to hitting a ton of fairways and now they're not and their rough game's not great, that can have a cost to it. Or even if it's just mentally, like they're just not used to playing out the rough and whatever, that can have its own sort of effect on it. So I'm always super mindful of that uh, with a tour person. So there's a lot of prep work. Maybe, you know, we start practicing your rough game a little bit more to try to get ahead of it. Or maybe there's a little bit of a different sort of perspective on the way you, you go about around a golf that has to change a little bit. It's like a little bit more of like a grinding kind of like attitude to it. So these are all sort of the factors that are potentially at play. Having said that, pretty much every tour person, I've given them a stack system, which I think is a great sort of like, uh, you know, speed training system. I've given it to them to start at least the conversation because if a person can, you know, over time, even like as they get older, slow down that process of losing club at speed with age, that could add an extra whatever years on their career at a high level, right? And the way I do with tour people is like, can you use something like a stack to increase your club head speed potentially over time, but really watch it to where you're not changing your core pattern. If I have someone do a stack training session I have them film before the session their swing. I have them film some of their stack swings and I have them film after the session to see if their swings changed at all. And if anything's changed, then it becomes back off of it, tap the brakes, add some constraints to how you're doing the stack session, for example. And even though it's a much slower process, it's also, in a sense, you know, minimizing the potential risk that could go with trying to get more speed and, and potentially changing your sort of best pattern. So with a tour person, I'm just like way more careful, much slower in the process, but that's kind of like the biggest difference in theme. But I will say that 
compared to a recreational golfer, I mean, this is only for that like elite where like that club face control is like super important. Most people, one, if they just hit it farther, it's gonna improve their game. And you could actually argue that in the process of doing something in their swing that's gonna help them hit it farther, they might actually get more club face control. Yeah. So for 99.9% .9 of the people, I'm not making those sort of concerns. It's just like, figure out a way to hit it farther, your swing's gonna probably improve to, in the process of doing that. You actually most likely gain club face control in that sort of overall improvement of your golf. Uh, Bryson recently said in a video that if, if something doesn't work quickly, scrap it. There, there's a lot of golf coaches that'll tell you, oh my goodness, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do this and that. When it doesn't work, stop doing it. And I see this a lot, especially with my background being speed. I know you thought it was short game, but it is speed. You know, the average person, it's like if they don't see crazy gains right out of the get-go, they give up on it. So what's, what's your thoughts on that? What Bryson's saying, I think, is, is true for someone at Bryson's level. Right, because for him, it's like if he gets a little bit better in his game overall, like that could be a ton of money. Theoretical Bryson, right? Could go from 10th in the world to the number one player in the world by like a small percentage of a shot better. But if they get worse, like they can lose their job. And it, it, intuitively, he's that's kind of what he's saying. It's like, like why am I gonna mess with something that can like mess up my game? If it's not working, I'm not gonna like, and especially for Bryson where he would work his butt off, like that could do some damage, right? Yeah. But. If you're like a 15 handicapper and like you want to get a lot better, you might have to commit to a process that could pull you a little bit worse in the short run. And it's like, okay, like, you know, you go from a 15 to an 18, your life's not changing like that much. But like, if you go from a 15 to a scratch, you're like, that's a huge jump in your game. So I do think what strategy someone has is somewhat dependent on where their skill level okay. is. Is there a lot of room for like the improvement side of it? If that's the case, then maybe you're willing to take on a little bit of risk and commit to a process that might actually make you worse in the short run, but you're rolling the dice a bit to have a big improvement on the upside. So I do think it's somewhat relative to a person's skill level. And again, for someone at price and skill level, I think what he was saying is 100% right. It's just, it's, it's gonna be different depending on where someone else is in their own sort of like skill level um, kind of part. If you had to give one tip to the average person, Chris Como's number one tip to increasing club at speed, what is it? Get a lesson from Josh. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Yes, do uh, that. <laughs> buy a stack system. Okay, buy a stack system. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, look, like I'm partnered with them, so it's like, ah, whatever, shameless plug. But it really is like a great system. It's, it's sort of the lowest hanging fruit that regardless of what your swing is or maybe what you're working on from a technique perspective, because there are things you can do from a golf like swing perspective that can help it. And that's like, I, you know, it's hard for me to answer that one because it's like, what are they currently doing? Generally speaking, longer backswings give you more time to put force in the club, whatever, yes. But for whatever your current technique is, if you can ramp yourself up to just be faster, you're gonna get more out of your current technique. And I think one of the best tools out there to do that is a stack training system. So that's why I say that. Guys, if you enjoyed that video, be sure to hit that like button. That was a good one, Chris. Thank you for your time today. Of course. Let's, uh, let's get some W's this year. All right.